¿Te imaginas tu viaje interrumpido y que nadie lo sepa? Suena extraño ahora que en todo momento estamos conectados conociendo la ubicación y la hora estimada de llegada, pero en el océano no es tan sencillo. El tráfico fluye con mucha más carga. ¿Sabías que existen personas cuidando del tráfico y de la carga que se mueve en el océano en tiempo real? Mantener una visión global actualizada de lo que ocurre en un mar que se extiende casi tres veces la superficie terrestre de Estados Unidos es complejo. Si ocurre algo no planificado, es necesario saberlo y así poder prestar la ayuda necesaria en una situación de emergencia, como un yate a la deriva sin mástil o un pesquero que se inunda en alta mar. La seguridad es imprescindible para quienes usan el mar como medio de transporte, trabajo y bienestar. Trazar este panorama y brindar la ayuda necesaria es uno de los grandes retos a los que pocos se enfrentan cada día. Yo solo puedo ser naturalmente mar. Pero quizás tú, ¿te imaginas? Avante, enfrenta el desafío. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Nuevamente les damos la bienvenida a Innova Polinam con esta hermosa vista desde la Academia Politécnica Naval. Les recuerdo que todos estos encuentros son posibles gracias al patrocinio del Gobierno Regional de Valparaíso y el soporte de Corfo con su programa de apoyo al entorno para el emprendimiento y la innovación. Les recuerdo que están disponibles las bases del concurso de innovación abierta Avante 2020. Además, el formulario de postulación ya está disponible para ser descargado y una vez que completen eh, los datos y seguir las instrucciones, tienen que enviar un correo electrónico desde ya a visitar nuestra web para en este desafío de innovación abierta. Estaremos recibiendo las postulaciones hasta el 30 de noviembre y si es que sus equipos son seleccionados podrán optar a recibir un entrenamiento dentro del programa Dual Tech de Corfo, perdón, de Know Hub Chile, que incluye las fases de Company Setup y acompañamiento del proceso de desarrollo del MVP, el cual será financiado de acuerdo a los montos indicados en las bases. de trabajo tendrá una duración de dos meses el 29 de marzo, con el objetivo de formar startups para el ecosistema de investigación, desarrollo e innovación que esperamos puedan trabajar con la Armada de Chile en la área de conciencia situacional marítima. No pueden perderse esta oportunidad de participar en la construcción de soluciones para nuestro mar. La semana pasada eh, contamos con la presencia de Javier Ramírez, eh, que es el director ejecutivo de Know Hub Chile, quien nos habló de la innovación y el emprendimiento en la Armada, si acaso se podía o no. Más aún, justificó el hecho de que las instituciones públicas no solo pueden, eh, sino que deben ser parte de este ecosistema. Si no pudieron estar presentes o les gustaría volver a ver cualquiera de las conferencias que ya se hayan realizado dentro del marco de Innova Polinab, pueden visitar nuestra página web www.innovapolinab.cl y ahí encontrarán nuestra sala de prensa donde estamos dejando disponibles todas las conferencias para que las puedan revisar. Nuestro compromiso con el, con el ecosistema al que estamos entrando ha sido adoptado desde el más alto nivel de la defensa nacional. Ya tuvimos al ministro de Defensa, algunos webinars atrás, don Mario Desbordes, quien reforzó la importancia de ser parte del mundo de la innovación y el emprendimiento para llevar a nuestro país al desarrollo. Hoy, el subsecretario de Defensa Nacional, don Cristian de la Maza Riquelme, nos acompaña para reforzar la importancia de que las Fuerzas Armadas extiendan sus fronteras de trabajo hacia este ecosistema. El subsecretario de la Maza conoce de cerca el trabajo de la Armada, ya que fue miembro del alto mando de la institución durante ocho años en diferentes cargos, destacando la Dirección General de los Servicios y la Presidencia del Consejo Superior de ASMAR. Es magíster en Ciencias Navales y Marítimas de la Academia de Guerra Naval y es diplomado en Gobiernos Corporativos de la Pontificia Universidad Católica. Dejo con usted al subsecretario de Defensa, don Cristian de la Marza, mi almirante, almirante en retiro, se me olvidó también decir, mi almirante, muy buenas tardes, qué gusto tenerlo con nosotros el día de hoy. Eh, eh, usted recordará esta hermosa vista de la Academia Politécnica Naval. Muchas gracias, el, eh, y muchas gracias por invitarme nuevamente y como subsecretario de, Fuerza, de Defensa y también como ex alumno de la Academia que usted está mostrando ahí para el vídeo. Eh, estoy muy contento de acompañarlo por eh, segunda vez en la Innova Polinar. Y este año también lo felicito porque, a pesar de las dificultades sanitarias, ustedes han encontrado la forma de seguir adelante. 
porque lo, lo urgente no debe hacernos perder de vista lo importante. Y, y lo importante está precisamente en esto, en tener una mirada de futuro, una mirada hacia adelante e, e ingresar claramente en la sociedad de la información. Y en esta oportunidad, además, nos presentan un desafío de innovación abierta, que es una novedad, este avance 2020. Ahora, este esfuerzo es totalmente coherente con la Política de Defensa Nacional 2020, y me voy a permitir extractar algunos párrafos que ilustran lo, lo anterior, y, y que dicen que la planificación para el desarrollo de capacidades estratégicas debe considerar el empleo de tecnología de punta, que ayude a lograr superioridad operacional como elemento potenciador de fuerzas, así como para lograr mayor eficiencia en aspectos de sostenimiento y desarrollo. La tecnología avanzada no solo debe procurarse para las plataformas y sistemas de armas, sino también para los sistemas y los procesos de toma de decisiones que exigen un manejo de grandes volúmenes de información en tiempos acotados, generalmente no factibles de procesar por la mente humana en los tiempos requeridos. Y en ese sentido debe introducirse tecnologías y algoritmos asociados a la robótica, inteligencia artificial, análisis de datos, vehículos no tripulados, nanotecnología, tecnología de materiales, ciencias sociales y otras. La inversión en investigación, desarrollo e innovación tecnológica para la defensa debe integrar a científicos, técnicos, universidades y centros de investigación nacionales de manera de contribuir al desarrollo del país. Y aquí se trata de generar una masa crítica altamente capacitada por medio del desarrollo de la industria nacional de defensa que genere externalidades positivas para la economía, el empleo calificado, el desarrollo científico tecnológico y la independencia de proveedores externos, entre otros beneficios. Eso es lo que dice en parte la política de defensa y, y este esfuerzo que está realizando la Armada es un ejemplo y un comienzo en esta nueva senda, de forma de combinar las necesidades institucionales con la eh, generación de valor para el país y además poner a disposición de la comunidad de investigación y desarrollo las distintas capacidades que tienen las Fuerzas Armadas. Y un ejemplo que estuvimos viendo hace un par de semanas, su lanzamiento fue el nuevo sistema nacional satelital, que precisamente da un salto importante hacia el mundo digital, hacia la sociedad del conocimiento y de la información, en beneficio de la defensa, pero también de todo el país. Así que quiero destacar la invitación que hace el desafío a 20, 2020, a todos los investigadores, innovadores y emprendedores nacionales. Con su talento y el esfuerzo, sumado a la cooperación y el esfuerzo de la Armada de Chile y el apoyo de la Armada de Chile, Estoy seguro que no solamente podrán desarrollar soluciones a los problemas planteados, sino también podremos impulsar una forma de relación virtuosa entre la defensa, la academia y los emprendedores que ven en la Cuarta Revolución Industrial, en la sociedad de la información, una oportunidad de desarrollo y bienestar para nuestro pueblo. Así que muchas gracias y éxito en la iniciativa. Elmirante, muchas gracias por sus palabras. La verdad es que estamos trabajando muy arduamente y muy involucrado en este nuevo ecosistema y por eso es que hoy tenemos eh, a Steve Blank, eh, conversaremos con él, que es el padre del espíritu moderno que nos ayudará a analizar por qué el futuro de la innovación está impulsado por la misión, cómo los emprendedores, inversores, líderes de la industria y el mundo académico pueden trabajar juntos para hacer del mundo un mejor lugar. Para que de esta manera con la, con la innovación y el emprendimiento, eh, Steve Blank, la verdad, no necesita una gran introducción. Es famoso con el lanzamiento del movimiento Lean, Start, eh, Lean Startup Method y ha cambiado la forma en que se construyen las startups en el mundo. Cómo se enseña el espíritu emprendedor, cómo se comercializa la ciencia y cómo innovan las empresas y el gobierno. Steve es el autor de The First Step to the Epiphany, The Startup Owners Manual y su artículo de portada de Harvard Business Review de mayo del 2013 consagró al movimiento del Lean Startup eh, en el ecosistema. 
Además es profesor en la Universidad de Stanford, Columbia, Berkeley, New York y creó el National Science Foundation Innovation Corps, eh, que ahora es parte del proceso estándar para la comercialización de la ciencia en los Estados Unidos. Su clase Hacking for Defense en Stanford está revolucionando el cómo la comunidad de inteligencia y defensa de Estados Unidos puede implementar la innovación con velocidad y urgencia. Y su clase hermana, Hacking for Diplomacy, está haciendo lo mismo con los desafíos de asuntos exteriores gestionados por el Departamento de Estados Unidos. Hoy día, eh, Steve Blank estará en un modo de entrevista con eh, el comandante Mackay, que es parte de nuestro equipo de innovación, Francisco Mackay, eh, va a tener una conversación con Steve Blank respecto de su visión eh, en el emprendimiento y relacionando lo que estamos haciendo en este desafío de innovación abierta. Así es que, sin más preámbulos, quiero dejar con ustedes al comandante Mackay y a Steve Blank para que demos inicio a esta interesante conversación. Muchas gracias, Jorge, por tus palabras de bienvenida. Voy a hacer una, vamos a estar recibiendo preguntas durante el webinar para que las, para las puedan enviar y me las hacen llegar para yo hacérselas a Steve. Voy a cambiar a inglés ahora, entonces, para comenzar la entrevista. Steve, very welcome to Chile. Glad to have you here with us today. Thank you for having me, Ben. So, so uh, to not waste any time, uh, I think we can have an icebreaker on, um, on a little bit how did all start. Uh, on your website, you have a story. You worked for 21 years in the industry and in different areas. And after retiring, and you retired to your home and to do some, uh, some thinking about lessons and things that you could share with the community. So, and what were the, the key insights you developed that Uh, led you to start the, the Lean Startup methodologies and present them? That's a great world. question. Um, as someone who was doing innovation for several decades, uh, we were told that startups were just smaller versions of large companies, that innovation was the same as what large companies did. And And our investors told us that we needed to write five-year plans and predict the future. And they needed to, and they told us that we needed to organize the same way large companies did. And that's what startups did for 25 years. It turns out that that's completely wrong. And that has all kinds of effects, not just for startups and for corporations, but importantly for defense organizations. It, it turns out that large organizations, at least uh, at the time, uh, executed what were called known business models. They knew their customers, they knew their partners, they knew their competitors, and more importantly, they could kind of predict what features and products those people wanted. But startups were very different. They were creating something that never existed before. And so using the same methods uh, actually were one not productive. No one had ever said or understood that startups are not smaller versions of large companies. Large companies execute known business models, but startups, startups search for business models. Uh, startups are trying to investigate the future while companies are trying to execute the present. Uh, this distinction uh, will come up time and again Um, and so I decided what we were missing is we had tools from business schools and from consulting organizations for large companies to execute. That is, they had product planning, they had stage gates and the defense departments, they have requirements and acquisition programs, but they had no tools for understanding customer needs and figuring out how to develop in a rapid fashion. And so that's what I decided to tackle. That's, I decided that we needed our own tools and own, uh, own techniques that were different from people who could predict the future. We couldn't predict the future, we were inventing the future. Oh, that's, that's great. And uh, you started thinking about that. You wrote a book during that decade and uh, start doing classes by It's 2009, I think. And uh, 
what how did your thinking evolve during that decade so so let me explain i i, I kind of it's a great question but before the class you know we came up with a set of tools a methodology a new way to think about innovation and you've used the word lean startup let me explain quickly what that actually meant number one is if you're doing something new having meetings inside a building is probably the wrong way to discover what people need and so the first step in understanding that was a new technique called customer development and customer development said there are no facts inside the building so let's get outside and by getting outside we meant actually going talking to users and and you know stakeholders and beneficiaries the second key part of lean was there was a new way to build products and services in the old days we would use something called waterfall engineering where we had a requirements we would go through acquisition where we would you know raise money if you were a startup uh, you would specify all the potential features you thought you needed and then you would just build it and then when you delivered it you assumed that that was what was needed and wanted and you did this in a step by step fashion it turned out in the 21st century there's a much more efficient way to build products and services and that's called agile engineering where we could build iterative and incremental pieces of the product testing it all the time and so part 2 of lean was agile engineering customer development and then agile engineering <clears throat> excuse me and then the third part of lean was simply well what are the things we need to be asking customers and testing with the product and there's a single piece of paper called the business model canvas for civilian of uh, uh, businesses and the mission model canvas for defense applications that simply says what are the nine things we need to be worrying about number 1 who are the stakeholders who are the beneficiaries who are the war fighters number 2 is what what product service or or mission requirements do they need so we call this product market fit in the civilian world or mission solution fit in the defense world and then how do you deploy it who needs to you know who do you need to get buy in from you know what's mission achievement or success or in the civilian world what's revenue and profit and so once you have this map you know what to test and you know how to constantly iterate and lean has a couple of interesting techniques number 1 it says you use agile engineering to build something called minimum viable products instead of a completely finished fully delivered product you build a incremental and iterative set of prototypes that test not just the product but all the other components of what's necessary to deploy or, or to ship the other thing is um and this is a radical idea is is that you're allowed to be wrong boy that's a big idea um, for for innovators and entrepreneurs no one loves failure but in silicon valley we have a special name for a failed entrepreneur do you know what it is francisco special name in english yeah it's a uh, failed no, entrepreneur no, no. a failed entrepreneur in silicon valley is called experienced not failed <laughs> and and that means is a pivot allows us to declare that we've actually learned something as we're talking to customers or stakeholders or whoever needs or wants what we thought and we discover we might be wrong the features might be wrong the customers might be wrong the pricing might be wrong and we're allowed to change in the middle of the process to match what we've learned if you really think about a existing acquisition system or existing way to build products there is no way to kind of course correct in the middle and so lean allowed us to do this rapidly incredibly rapidly is why startups were able to operate much faster than their competitors it's why spacex was able to build you know a whole new system of reusable rockets in the same time the us is still working on a, a traditional next generation rocket it's why tesla was able to uh, kind of outperform every automobile company in the world not just because of technology but because of the methodology which they used and so we built this lean startup system and it caught fire in silicon valley meaning it was adopted rapidly um in the first decade of the 21st century 
but there were still no classes to teach it. If you went to a, any university, the school, the, the class you would take for innovation was how to write a business plan. But we knew by then that no business plan survives first contact with customers. That is, you could write a plan, but the minute, the minute you ran into a customer, that plan would change based on the facts on the ground. And so what I did was I developed a new course um, uh, inside of universities. It's called the Lean Launchpad. And eventually, as adopted by the US government, it was called i that put all these pieces together. Students would come in with their own ideas as a team, because entrepreneurship happens as a team, not as an individual. And then every week, they would get out of the classroom and talk to 10 to 15 customers a week, testing their ideas and validating parts of the business model canvas. Um, and it was a radically new way to teach innovation and entrepreneurship. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the US government adopted it. Um, and we could talk about that in a second. Did I answer your, your first question? Uh, perfectly, uh, perfectly. I have just one thought. Uh, it's why the name minimum viable product? It, because from what my understanding, it's not actually a product. It's, it's more a mean to get answers from different customers or beneficiaries in that sense. Is that yes. right? Yeah, it could be a minimum viable anything. Uh, to me, an MVP is whatever gets you the most learning at any point of time of any part of the business or mission model canvas. It could be about the product. It could be the people like this feature or do they like this price or, 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 but it could be, you know, is this the right way to deploy or is this the right, you know, should we be looking instead of the war fighter, should we be looking at the general or the admiral or G is, uh, um, are we missing this capability? But it's called MVP because people like to think about it as product, um, but, it, but its meaning is, as you pointed out, much deeper. It's a way to test all the, all the things about success. Um, and MVP in, in some of the uh, places we've been is, uh, has uh, the security folks looked at the uh, product or service and see if it's okay to kind of use or, um, you know, have we talked to our partners or do we have the right data feeds? All those are MVPs we could be testing very early. Perfect. So it's a little or no amount of engineering in producing those MVPs, uh, which is what, what gives you the, the speed in developing, I, I guess. Well, there's a, a couple of things. One is, and, and I think, um, this has real impact in defense departments now as well in the US and, and certainly in the Western world. We used to believe without ever saying it that we could predict the future. We knew what kind of airplanes we needed in 10 or 20 years. We knew what kind of aircraft carriers or ships we knew uh, would need in the next 10 or 20 years. And we knew those things um, because at least in the military world, our adversaries were known and the types of technologies that we were all using were kind of known. In the last five or 10 years, all those have kind of gone out the window, meaning they've disappeared. The, there's a whole new set of technologies that just have all hit us at once, whether they're cyber or unmanned vehicles, or autonomy, AI, uh, hypersonics, space, uh, you know, low cost access to space. Um, you know, the whole list of new technologies and a whole list of new adversaries, at least for the United States, we went from the last 20 years de dealing with non-nation states to now we call them the two plus three. We, we, in the U.S., we now have to focus on China and Russia and, and uh, also North Korea, Iran, and still the non-nation states. So now our adversaries have gone up by five and the new technologies have gone up by maybe 10. And more importantly, we no longer own that is in the military, we no longer own these technologies. Most of them are being driven by uh, commercial companies. And I'm sorry for the digression, but the, but the motivation for using lean techniques is simply driven for, from the, the old ways of doing business and thinking about um, deploying products and services, whether they're commercial or military, just no longer makes sense. And, it's, and it makes your head explode because the systems we still have in place 
inside of corporations and inside of government agencies are still all dependent for us to be able to think we could pre-compute what's coming down the line by simply writing requirements and, uh, and acquiring things that take years or decades to, to get on the line. We need to move much faster. And, uh, and, and Lean uh, gives us the ability to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Uh, I guess what comes to my mind is I have a little background in sciences. And uh, this looks like a hypothesis, experiment, analysis of results. So it's, it's kind of science brought to the startup uh, environment, if you wish. Yeah, so, so what's very interesting, Francisco, is I, I mentioned I started this class at Stanford. And, and, and what I did was, I, because it was such a new idea, I decided to blog or write about it every week, you know, about for every class week. And what I didn't realize is back in Washington, at our National Science Foundation, the head of the uh, innovation or commercialization activity called the SBIR program was reading every class session. And when the class ended, the NSF, our National Science Foundation adopted the class as the standard for commercializing all science in the US because of exactly what, he said, what you just said. He said, Steve, you've reinvented the scientific method and just applied it to innovation and entrepreneurship. And so in the US, the, what's called the i program, i is now taught in 98 universities uh, for um, the National Science Foundation. It was adopted by a couple of divisions of our uh, National Institute of Health and relevant here as part of the story is uh, five years ago, it was adopted across our intelligence community. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a program that's at least been officially acknowledged called uh, i -Corps at the National Security Agency. And they've put more people through the program than actually the civilian version. Um, uh, being able to kind of rapidly build uh, innovative new products and, and services. Um, and, uh, and it was uh, there inside the NSA that we discovered that we needed to translate some of these concepts from business concepts into military and defense concepts. So what we used before was called the business model canvas and we changed it into something called the mission model canvas. Since, uh, uh, since someone pointed out that if we were making revenue and profit in the military, somebody was gonna go to jail. So in fact, the, the metrics were no longer revenue, but mission achievement and mission success. And that distribution channel was actually in the military, we talked about deployment. How do we deploy the products and services into the hands of the war fighters and stakeholders? Um, so, so that was kind of the background of uh, eventually what led to hacking for defense. But, but again, the methodology started in, uh, with me kind of understanding that, that we needed some different tools for innovation. Uh, then it turned in, uh, got adopted by startups, then turned into a class at Stanford then turned into uh, uh, adoption by the US government in, in both the civilian and uh, uh, intelligence community and then the Department of Defense. Um, and then in the last uh, four, you were also five years, we started the Hacking for Defense program, which was the same curriculum, but this time, instead of students or scientists coming in with their own ideas, we went out to our Department of Defense and uh, intelligence community and ask them to give us problems that we would have students work on. And ironically, uh, this was funded by our Office of Naval Research. Um, the ONR in the United States has a pretty proud history of funding innovation and entrepreneurship before any other service. And, and it sure looks like the same thing is true in Chile, um, is that the Navy tends to lead um, in terms of innovation. So Francisco, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you cover a lot of ground there, uh, but I want to uh, step back a little bit. And when when you started with the with the NSF, by the way, the National Science Foundation is probably the um, the, the largest agency funding science in the U.S. Uh, am I right? With uh, that definition, two major um, agencies. The NSF funds everything but medical and life sciences. So the U.S. government funds uh, basic and applied research with uh, 
a lot of dollars. Our National Institute of Health does basic and applied research. Uh, I think last time I looked, it was about 30 or $35 billion of both basic research and then applied for life sciences, medicines, vaccines, et cetera. The National Science Foundation funds everything else. And instead of doing applied research, they're almost 100% basic research. Um, that is just basic uh, knowledge gathering. And they have about an $8 billion budget. But both of those, uh, uh, both of those agencies fund um, uh, researchers in our universities. That's where the money goes to. And all of them and all our federal research agencies have by law um, to allocate 2% of their budget for any of those scientists who've gotten money, any of them who want to start a company uh, based on that science, it's a law that says 2% of that money needs to go to funding those companies. Uh, and that's called the SBIR program. And the Department of Defense also has that kind of commercialization money as well. Um, so there's kind of a machinery, an, an engine that funds basic research, applied research, and then a commercialization pipeline. And the i program that I helped start is basically the, the curriculum that funds that commercialization or that teaches scientists and engineers how to take their technology and turn it into a, a, a business or, or something that could help with the Defense Department. Perfect, great explanation. But I, um, I guess my question now is, you started from the Lean uh, Launchpad, which was yes. thought for entrepreneurs. Yes. The technology was mature enough for they to take it and package it and send it to the market. Yes. But now, when you go to NSF, probably you are uh, well below in the TRL level. I mean, yep. where you were targeting probably right after basic research, it's not mature enough. So it's a different challenge to start a startup from there instead of starting from level seven. For, for instance. Yes, <laughs> actually, and one of the biggest challenges, uh, which was a surprise to me, um, you know, for uh, we're in, in, uh, in encountering scientists and, uh, and world-class researchers, the difference between an introvert and an extrovert was whether they were looking at their shoes or my shoes. Um, <laughs> Uh, part of the part of the program was teaching them how to make eye contact with potential customers. Uh, it's a big idea is that, um, as you pointed out, this wasn't only a TRL level. In fact, let me just point out if, if your audience is familiar with TRL, it's basically a technology readiness level that we used to use or, or agencies still use to say whether something is ready to deploy. And what we discovered is that was like saying the halftime score in football was three. Well, three to what? <laughs> you know, having something be commercialized is not just the readiness of the technology, but is the readiness of, you know, the commercial viability and the readiness of the team. So we came up with three other metrics that, you know, um, that parallel the TRL. One is the investment readiness level. And then the other one is the team readiness level. Those are the components that make uh, a technology turn into a viable company or something that could be deployed. And so part of the class was teaching those scientists and engineers that it's not just about your tech, that, that an idea is only a small part of what makes a successful company and that they needed to understand customers and markets and competitors and pricing and, and channel, et cetera. And the class was perfectly suited to take them across what we call that ditch of death. Uh, that why did, why did it, scientists fail? Well, they had no idea what a company looked like because they were, the only tools they had was how to write a business plan, which was completely irrelevant to what they needed to learn. Did that answer your question? Perfectly, absolutely perfectly. Uh, we can switch a little bit to, towards the hacking for defense, I guess right now, how do you, do you get involved in hacking for the fans? Did the services came to you? Uh, ah. Was your idea going to them? 
So, so about three or four things intersected. As you mentioned earlier in the introduction, I spent four years in the US Air Force during Vietnam. And uh, at least in the United States, uh, we ended any form of national service uh, after the Vietnam War about 45 years ago. And my personal belief is that has been a bad thing um, for, our, for at least our country. Um, people no longer believe that service to the country was part of being a citizen. Um, and I think uh, that's had all kinds of bad consequences. And when I mean service, national service, I don't mean only working in the military, any type of service is now no longer mandatory in the United States. And so in the back of my mind, I always wondered if there was some way to get my students um, in a world-class research university who would never consider working for or even talking to anybody in the government to at least learn about what the problems were the government was working on. And at the same time, so that was on, in my head, always had been in the back of my mind. How do, I, how do I contribute to doing this? At the same time, I ran into someone named Pete Newell who uh, just started a company called BMMT. And Pete had run the US Army's rapid equipping force which was a way to kind of do what I was just talking about, but in the real world of solving immediate battlefield problems by deploying and finding new technologies and systems uh, to solve problems on the battlefield in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, getting, finding and removing improvised explosive devices, getting people out of caves, you know, et cetera. And, and uh, Pete had developed a methodology and we had, we just met and, and he drew his methodology on the whiteboard and, and I drew mine and we realized <laughs> we were drawing the same thing. So Pete had an actually, because he really was solving real battlefield problems. Pete uh, was an army colonel and had been in the second battle of Fallujah in, in Iraq um, and had faced uh, these threats for real. Um, and while I was solving them in boardrooms, Pete's observation is, is that you really need to understand the customer problems before you start using a methodology to even solve them. Uh, you know, when I worked on these things, the, the problems weren't given, but the technology was given. Pete was working from the other end that said, well, I have a problem. People are getting blown up, you know, by IEDs. Um, but his methodology really was, well, is that a symptom or is that the problem? And of course, using IEDs is a great example. As it turns out, getting blown up is, you know, only the symptom. You didn't solve the, you know, what was what was the left of the boom? You know, where where were they coming from? Who was making them, etc. And some national service, and came up with a class with a third uh, U.S. Army colonel named Joe Felter. And. Uh, we decided to start a class based on my uh, i core lean launchpad class but this time to go out to our defense department and intelligence community and say give us your toughest problems and we'll get students and universities to work on them and with onr funding office of naval research funding at stanford uh, and with bmmt's help we put together uh, the first version of the class at stanford pete and i and joe taught it called hacking for defense and it was so successful, it ended up uh, uh, scaling and then being funded by our Defense Department. And it's now in 40 or 50 uh, universities across the US. Um, way past, you know, I just teach the Sanford version, but incredibly successful, incredibly supported uh, with an infrastructure. Um, did I answer your question? Sure, absolutely. I what. What really surprises me about that from a more Navy point of view is you said uh, there's, there are 40 universities in the US that are running the program right now. And I think the number is growing. Yeah. Uh, how many teams do you accept for the class each year? Um, at Stanford, we, we tend to fill them up. We have, uh, so first of all, you, you mentioned teams. So we, we do teams of four um, and they typically have to have you know, a technology, at least one or two technology people capable of uh, understanding the, the, the technical solution and then other team members. And we take up to eight uh, in, a, in, in a class. Other universities have smaller uh, groups. Uh, they, 
the teams are typically uh, four, but some some of them run it with two teams, some of them run it with four or six. Um, it depends on how many they could recruit. At Stanford, we tend to we have to turn people away, so that's a it's a nice problem to have. <laughs> yes, it is in fact a nice problem to that. But if you think you have, let's say four teams per university. 40, uh, 40 universities in the plan, which means it's 160 problems that are being reviewed by, by grad students all across the country every year. So 160 problems per year, it's a huge number. And, I, and I can, I'm guessing the cost for the, net, for the services for doing that is not that great. So I think that's kind of magic. Yeah, it, it's really magic if you think about it. We've now kind of looked at close to a thousand problems, but the real magic was a surprise to me, to be honest. Uh, you know, if you remember, my goal was just to get students talking to the military and, and, and kind of bridging that gap and assume they would go join Facebook or Google or something else. But a couple of surprising things have happened. Uh, number one is there's been some real interesting teams that have started uh, in the class. Um, in the first class, we five years ago, we had a startup called Capella Space, and they made the first CubeSats for synthetic aperture radar to look at you know, problems at sea <laughs> for illegal fishing. And now they've been launching uh, on a regular basis. Um, and uh, uh, the other surprise was the number of students who continued to work <clears throat> excuse me, with their government sponsors after the class. I thought the number would be zero. On average, it's about 40%. And, and it doesn't mean they joined the military. It just means they either joined or they are consulting for or some parts of the team. And then in our last class at Stanford, um, uh, BMMT uh, put together a incubator for teams that wanted to follow up and actually build what we call dual use companies, ones that could sell to the defense department and commercial and thinking, well, how many of those eight teams would like to follow it up? A hundred percent. All eight teams <laughs> entered the incubator. And, and so my head's kind of exploding because it's kind of turned out a little better than I thought. Um, and the, and the class actually um, um, is now kind of established and is successful. And, and so we started our, another class uh, just this quarter called uh, Technology, Innovation and Modern War, um, which is a way to kind of look at all the challenges that um, I, I mentioned earlier about disruption uh, that uh, you know, the US Defense Department intelligence community are encountering and thinking about policy and, and uh, and how you deal with these issues, which is different from hacking for defense. But uh, um, boy, I got a real education about um, what we need to change rapidly. And and uh, you know, in the United States, and I'll just I'll just give you this di digression for for thirty seconds. The big takeaway I have is that um, all the legacy systems that the U.S. built in the twentieth century that made us the dominant um, superpower are are obsolete or about to be obsoleted um, literally in, the, in, in, in a decade. You know, a good example is since we're talking to a Navy audience, the U.S.'s ability to project power in the, in, in the, uh, in the Western Pacific has kind of been negated by uh, asymmetric weapons and, uh, and other things the Chinese have done. And so if your entire strategy was built around, you know, uh, carrier strike groups, um, all of a sudden, you have to think a little more uh, creatively. Um, you know, drones and autonomous vehicles and AI and, you know, tonight in this class, we have General Raymond, the head of our Space Force coming in and talk to us. And it used to be the US kind of owned space as the high ground with really exquisite systems that were few in number. Well, those can now be targeted fairly easily. And all of a sudden, those assets would probably disappear in the first 15 minutes of any conflict. So now all of a sudden we have to be a lot more creative about how you, uh, how you deal with these things. Um, you know, some of the other things now back to hacking for defense we had in the class is uh, we're in California and our, uh, one of our biggest problems is interdicting uh, drug smugglers, uh, whether it's a Coast Guard problem or a Navy problem. And, um, and, and here the problem turned out to be, and, and we must have 
every year this becomes some different branch uh, gives us the same problem. Um, it, it turns out to be less so a technology problem and more so a sensor fusion problem of, uh, you know, how to use overhead assets and uh, unmanned vehicles in an in a architecture with Navy and, and Coast Guard that was used to be dependent on surface ships and helicopters. And, and so it's, it, it's kind of now almost not funny seeing the same problem come up every year in Hagging for Defense. Um, when, I, when you can almost draw what the solution should be, but because you have existing, existing officers with existing mindsets that still believe in ships and helicopters, and this is the way we did business versus, well, you know, there are other ways to kind of think about solving the problem. Does that, Francisco, I know I, I kind of answered about five different questions you didn't ask, but. <laughs> yes, you, you robbed me <laughs> about sorry. five questions. No, That's no, no, true. Sorry. But, uh, uh, I, I, as you can tell, I'm having a lot of well, fun uh, uh, because these are serious <laughs> and tough problems for every country. Um, we're in a we're in an age of transition that probably we haven't seen in a couple of hundred years, um, where lots of things are changing at the same time. Um, adversaries are changing, technology is changing, threats are changing, and the consequences of those changing are are pretty dramatic. Um, and so, you know, my small part in hacking for defenses part is try to figure out how we rapidly can can kind of connect the best and the brightest with some of the military problems, both in the US and Chile. And it's a one heck of an effective program in doing that. It's probably the cheapest thing that a Defense Department could invest in. Um, the, the only real investment that we've seen that's really necessary is the investment of a sponsor giving us a real problem. Not something some colonel or admiral handed down to three levels to some poor ensign who has to kind of talk to the students but something that, that is a real problem that, that they invest the time and people and contacts in helping the students kind of peel the layers to the problem. Because as I said earlier, and let me make it clear, almost 100% of the time, the problem is given to the students is simply a symptom of a much bigger problem and more interesting problem. Um, you know, my favorite that I think I could talk about here is uh, gee, an intelligence problem that says we need this part of data. And the students run off thinking they need to build a new data warehouse or data lake. And okay, it's just a, you know, and then they discover, no, that's not the problem at all. The problem is we already have that data, but security doesn't allow that data to go from this silo to this silo. Um, and so, you know, when you peel those, peel those problems, uh, things become really interesting. Um, you learn lots of things about the organization and about sometimes it's not a tech problem at all. Sometimes it's a, what we call a silo problem or a security problem or a policy problem. Um, or someone's cousin runs the company that makes the, the existing system that like um, needs to be obsoleted. Um, so that's the story. Yes, you, uh, you were right on my next question I was inventing. <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I loved about the, uh, I saw the videos of your students on, on YouTube and how they start with a problem and ended up solving a di completely different one in the end. Once they start digging in the services and interviewing people, they start correlating the data and everything and say, wait a minute, this was problem A was not the real problem. Problem B is the problem. Uh, I heard some good stories about that. So, um, but on the other hand, you were talking about the follow-up of the course with BMNT. Uh, what, what happened with the teams? Once they leave the course, they have certain tools, they have, they have not have now the mission fit uh, with their MVP, and now they have to realize the real problem. How, how do you handle the follow-up of the class? Yeah, so, so number one is they think they have product mission fit or solution mission fit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, almost always they have optimized a local maximum, not the global maximum. Sometimes they have. Um, and, and so kind of the incubator does a couple of things for them. It, it helps them further refine their MVPs. That is, they constantly iterate. Um, 
more importantly, because they're now working on dual use products is how do they get funding? What kind of requirements that is, how do they plug into the defense funding network of, of is it a OTA, other transaction authority? Should they uh, apply for an SBIR grant? Is That is, where's the money gonna come from if they wanna sell to the military? And at the same time, a lot of these companies are trying to also create dual use companies. That is ones that uh, could sell commercially. And so now they're testing do any of these have commercial applications as well? Um, again, the synthetic aperture radar uh, satellite CubeSat, we're a good example is, would people pay for that? Or is that gonna, on the commercial world, or is that just gonna be a, you know, an NGO, uh, 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 excuse me, National Geospatial Agency, an NGA kind of data feed. Um, and so they uh, test some of that. The key part, by the way, of um, both Hacking for Defense and this Hacking for X Labs, this follow-on incubator, was we surround the teams with mentors. That it's not just them by themselves and the professors kind of beating them with a stick. Um, it's that in the class, they have an industry or, or defense mentor. And in the Hacking for X Labs, they have coaches and mentors kind of suggesting, well, have you talked to these people? Have you considered that? Have, you know, is this what you really thought you learned? And and how do you get your first order? And how do you get to the first product? And um, and I was um, I was kind of pretty surprised because I watched the final presentations um, out of the labs, and it was really a lot of fun because just like you, I saw their final class presentations, and here you know three months later I get to see them almost in this think of it as a uranium enrichment process. You put in low grade feedstock <laughs> getting, and you get fissionable yes. material out of the end. I was ready to write a check to two out of them. Um, and that's a pretty high number. Uh, there were two that I thought were fundable startups right then. Um, and, and these were students who had just come in working on a military problem. Um, so, so yeah, I think that we, we kind of, or at least we, meaning BMMT, uh, has this process that uh, really is kind of interesting. And, and I think they're also uh, working with uh, uh, companies in, the, in, in, in uh, NATO on, on this as well. Um, it's really turned into an interesting process. Um, and it's, think of it as Y Combinator for, for military, uh, military applications. Great. That's great. I'm going to switch to some questions from the audience now. Um, I have a question that says, is there a methodology to come up with the, with the problems? How do you come yeah. up with great challenges? So, so this is, this, is, this I'll hand back and, and credit to, full credit to Pete Newell and BMMT. And this was the part that he got really well done at uh, the rapid equipping force. There's now a whole sponsor guide, meaning back to the military. Here's what a good problem looks like. In fact, they actually train sponsors for half a day on how to develop problem sets. Um, and and by the way, to be honest, and we still get crappy problems, but but at least there is <laughs> for for developing uh, good problems for sponsors. And in fact, if you really think about this. This is now one of the fundamental problems of, of existing requirements and acquisition pipelines is, is that, you know, requirements were again, I'll go back to what I originally said, back in the, in the 20th century were predictable. We need a bigger aircraft carrier or a, or a more capable frigid. Um, well, that's no longer the problems anymore. We might need, you know, unmanned submersibles, or we might need, need long-range UAVs, not not just more the same. And the same with problems. Sometimes you look at a problem and just say, I need a better version of X, without realizing, well, well it's not the weapon system. It might be you need a different operational concept. Whoa. Well, if I need a new different operational concept, what about my existing weapons? <laughs> well, we could repurpose some of them, but you need to be thinking about some other ways to solve the problems. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. Is um, I, I mentioned I used to get all these things about uh, uh, maritime problems and hacking for defense at Stanford, and one of them actually was in the South China Sea, and it was about illegal fishing. And 
you know, someone finally figured out that, well, wait a minute, why don't we engage NGOs into the problem as well? Well, no one had ever thought about NGOs. It was always thought about this was a military or, or Coast Guard problem. Well, you know, I won't go through the detail, but now all of a sudden, some combination of persistent surveillance of illegal fishing via synthetic aperture radar and engaging NGO fleets and other fleets that kind of engage illegal fisheries can add some a force multiplier that no one had ever thought of, or at least no one had ever engaged before. So to answer your question, yes, the, there's a whole training uh, uh, process and guide that BMMT has put together, and they tend to, and they are the ones who filter out all the problems or collate all the problem sets uh, across the DOD for, uh, for the program. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, a different one to also from the audience is how a startup can figure out what is the correct audience for the MVP. Wow. Um, so, so on day one, you know, founders have a vision of, you know, what they want to build and who they want to build it for. Um, and, you know, we think of founders as visionaries. But one of the things I've learned is that most founders are actually hallucinating, um, meaning they're wrong. <laughs> uh, in, in fact, if you really think about it, a startup on day one is a faith-based organization. It's, real, it's a religious activity because you have to believe. Um, and the goal is to use this methodology to turn faith into facts as rapidly as possible. And what I mean by this, to answer your question, the founders could believe, here are our customers, that's great. In the old days, the mistake we would make is not changing any of that, it's just simply assuming we were correct. In the new model, in the lean model, we say, well, that's a hypothesis. Now let's get out of the building and test whether this is the right stakeholder or warfighter or customer or whatever or beneficiary. And we could see whether they're the ones we should be talking to. And most often we discover, no, it's not these people over here, it's the people over here, or it's some combination of people we didn't even know about. So, so the answer is, it's okay to have a good first guess or hypothesis, but then get out and rapidly test uh, who that is. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I, and I think this will be almost the last one uh, because we're running out of time. Um, there is, this is a business owner that is asking if MVPs are just for startups or also recommended for established companies. Well, the whole process is recommended for established companies because most businesses um, are also being disrupted by, you know, internet, China, retail going away, COVID, you know, all sets of things. And so MVPs allow you to rapidly test new ideas uh, uh, in a way that traditional, you know, product management tools and stage gate tools uh, don't allow you to do. Um, MVPs kind of assume you don't know the future, but you want to rapidly test your ideas. So the answer is yes. The biggest problem in large companies though, and in government agencies is that you need typically parallel processes for innovation and execution. That is the existing processes for execution almost always strangle innovation activities and you need to be aware of those. Perfect, thank you very much, Steve. I think we are just on time for finish it up. Uh, as a last question, I would say, um, what would be your advice for people in the audience who want to be mission-driven entrepreneurs? Well, um, you know, number one is you need passion. Um, you know, and, and by definition, a mission-driven entrepreneur is someone who doesn't want a job, but actually wants to drive their lives and careers based on mission. Um, you know, someone who wants to make a difference, someone who sees things that other people don't and who hears things that other people don't and want to move the world to their way. Um, you know, the lean methodology gives those people a tool set or framework 
uh, that will help them not have to invent the tools to do that. Um, and it's this passion to the mission that will help them kind of move through all the obstacles that they will encounter, whether they're bureaucratic obstacles or technical obstacles or you know, other things that come in way, but they will change the world and they will make, uh, they will make businesses better and they'll, they'll make your country better. Thank you. If this were business as usual, people should applaud right now. You, you should, should hear their clapping. And so thank you very much for being with us today, Steve. I think the audience had a great time, hopefully. And, uh, and I guess, uh, hopefully we can have you here in the future. If you come down to Chile, we have some good uh, uh, weather here and some good wine you can enjoy. Well, I've been to Chile before. I've been to Valparaiso and all the way to the, uh, to the, to the tip of Chile. And uh, I enjoyed the, uh, enjoyed the country. It's a, it's a beautiful country. Um, it's a, it's a, it looks to me a, a lot like California. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to come back. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. You too. Thank you very much. Okay. Bueno, esperamos que hayan disfrutado de esta interesante conversación entre el comandante Macay y Bank. Eh, está además volver a invitarlo a que nos sigan todos los martes, que nos sigan en redes sociales y recuerden entrar a nuestra página web y descargar las bases del concurso de innovación abierta Avante 2020. Está eh, las bases del concurso y ya está listo el formulario para la postulación que estaremos recibiendo hasta el 30 de noviembre. Así es que a llenar los formularios, a cumplir con el proceso y esperamos sus postulaciones. Eh, como decía el comandante Macay, ya nos quedamos casi sin tiempo, así que reiterar los agradecimientos a Steve Blank, que feliz lo esperaríamos acá en Chile para marzo, donde vamos a tener nuestro evento presencial de Innova Polinab. Eh, así es que extendemos desde ya esa invitación, sería todo un honor tenerlo con nosotros. Eh, eh, esperamos, obviamente, que eh, ustedes nos sigan todos los martes a las 3 de la tarde. Así que desearles una feliz tarde eh, y nos vemos el próximo martes. Recuerden descargar las bases para estar al día en la postulación. Que estén muy bien. Muy buenas tardes. Soy vida, desde antes de que existiera la propia vida. Soy fuerza, y rujo desde las entrañas de la misma tierra. Soy quien se rompe, quien estalla, quien se postra ante ti, quien estuvo antes de que tú llegaras, y quien estará cuando te marches. Soy quien conocerá a tus hijos, y a los hijos de tus hijos, quien les marcará el rumbo. Soy quien les mostrará los espacios eternos y las líneas infinitas allá en el horizonte. Soy el aire que respiras, el sol que ciega tus ojos, la brisa que te roza en la piel. Soy el poder de alimentarte, de transportarte, de proveerte de futuro. Soy todo lo que esperas que sea. Y aún soy más. Ocupo tanta superficie del planeta que no serías capaz de imaginar. Y albergo tanta nueva vida, nuevas especies animales y ecosistemas que no alcanzarías a comprender. Estoy en las dos terceras partes del mundo en el que habitas. Soy la inmensidad que no puede calcularse. Soy tu mayor grandeza. Y estoy aquí, por ti, desde antes que tú llegaras. Y seguiré aquí, después de que te marches, si es que lo permites. Soy tu desafío, el de salvarme y velar por mí el de vigilarme, controlarme y mantenerte alerta, el de protegerme y prevenirte, el de luchar por mí. Soy el desafío de que me salves, para salvarte tú. ¿Te importo? ¿Te importa el mar que tranquilo baña tus costas? He venido a desafiarte, a pedirte que des un paso al frente y formes parte, porque soy tu mayor grandeza. Y estoy aquí por ti. ¿Y tú? Avante. Enfrenta el desafío.